Do you have a need to extend your home network around your property? Does your work from home shed, detached garage or office need fast, reliable internet? Well, today I'm gonna to explain how to set up fiber optic networking at home on a budget for the highest bandwidth and lowest latency remote work and gaming experience this little shed has ever seen. Out here in the gaming shed, I like to have a low latency, high speed connection to the rest of my home network. Wi-Fi doesn't really reach out here, even though I have an outdoor access point on my deck. So the options I have are a point-to-point -point wireless setup, running an ethernet cable underground, or running fiber underground, and I've chosen fiber. Fiber is a great choice because of the inherent lightning protection and voltage isolation you get between the two buildings you're connecting. And also, it's not as expensive as you think to run fiber. And even if you might not need it now, fiber can handle extremely high speeds, something that might be great as a way to future-proof your network. Fundamentally, to set up a fiber network, we need three things. We need the fiber itself, we need a media converter, a network card, or a network switch that has a slot for a fiber transceiver, and we need a fiber transceiver matched to both the type of slot we're using and the type of fiber we're using. For this video, I'm only going to talk about 1 and 10 gigabit Ethernet over OM3 or OS2 multi-mode and single-mode fiber. I'm aware that there are many other options, but for a simple home use case, one of these is probably what you need. In general, for home installations, there are two types of fiber you should choose. OM3 multi-mode or OS2 single mode. OM3 multi-mode will usually have a teal jacket with blue connectors and OS2 single mode will have a yellow jacket with blue connectors. Yes, I'm aware one of my cables doesn't follow the coloring standard. If the coloring standard is followed, a blue connector will have a flat polish and a green connector will have an angled polish. In general, networking fiber and all of the equipment I've linked uses a flat polish or a UPC. That should be a blue connector if it's color coded. A green or APC polish would be used in like fiber to the home. That tends to use SC connectors. All of the stuff I'm linking uses LC connectors, tiny little things here. Historically, multi-mode fiber and transceivers were considerably cheaper than single mode, so they'd be used at any distance they were capable of. However, that distance has gone down as speeds have gone up so with modern 25 gig, you can only go about 75 meters officially with OM3 multi-mode, but you can go many tens of kilometers with single mode. Single mode also has another neat trick, wavelength division multiplexing. With this technique, you can use a single fiber to transmit more than one stream of information by using a different color, so to speak. So you could use this to transmit a huge amount of bandwidth by splitting all the bandwidth up into different colors. Or you can send data in both directions by using a different color for each, di uh, for each direction. This is called bi dye or bi-directional. I have a run in my house that runs from my basement to my upstairs laundry room where I can have networking equipment and stuff. And I used a bi dye fiber because it only has one connector, so it's very tiny and very easy to pull through very small places. Looking back, I probably could have fit a dual duplex fiber for a different fiber for each direction, but bi dye wasn't very expensive and I did it. So if you're trying to pull through an existing conduit or something, bi dye might be a good option for you. Otherwise, you need to run two fibers, one fiber for each direction, whether that's multi-mode or single mode. If you're in the US following the National Electric Code, there is an allowance to run completely non-conductive fiber in a conduit with electrical wiring. If you're outside of the US, obviously check your local laws. I don't know what they are, but it's important that this is non-conductive. There can be no metallic armoring in the fiber. So some fibers will have a metallic sheath to prevent them from being bitten or something like that but uh, you can't run that type of fiber through a, through a conduit with power wiring. You have to run a purely non-metallic armoring with something like Kevlar or something like that. So even if multi-mode sounds great to you because of the potentially lower cost, another thing to consider is what fibers you can actually buy. If you're going outdoors and need an outdoor rated fiber, that pretty much only exists in single mode OS2. So if you want to do underground stuff or strong aerials or whatever, mul uh, single mode is your option. If you are going outdoors, you should buy an outdoor rated cable, even if it's underground. This particular unit has a TPU jacket, which is not susceptible to UV like PVC is, standard PVC jackets. This one's also metallically armored, so it should be more robust to rodents or things like that. You're still gonna be able to dig through it and then have to replace it, but uh, it's better than nothing, right? For my gaming house, I chose a basic OS2 single mode fiber with two pairs, one for each direction. I had it custom made to the length I needed I typed in the number of feet. A month later, I got a package in the mail, custom-made fiber. I didn't have to do any termination, and that's great, and it didn't cost much. Not sponsored, but links to where I got it below. And for protecting your data in your gaming bunker, maybe you should check out today's sponsor, Private Internet Access. 
If you're browsing online for all of those Linux ISOs, everyone from your ISP to the server at the other end can see and log your IP address, which can be traced back to you. If you're in the US, Comcast is probably reading and monetizing your DNS queries. And if you're on a particularly sketchy network, the network might even inspect your SNI headers to see what site you're connecting to, even if you use HTTPS. Private internet access creates a secure tunnel between you and one of their servers. So your traffic masquerades as their server, along with all of the traffic from all of the other customers on that server. Your ISP and the network you're on can't see any hints of your traffic, and the websites you connect to can't see your real IP address. Aside from the potential security advantages for some of your traffic, you can also use one of their servers in a different country to browse sites or stream media available only to that country or region. Maybe you're from the US and jealous that literally everyone else in the world can watch Eurovision. Let's hop on the app here, pick a country, I don't know, let's say Finland. Let's do that. And... There we go, there's the green grape. They also support integrating with home routers or your own clients using OpenVPN. So let me know if you want a video in the future on how to configure policy routing for VPNs in OpenSense. If you're interested, use my link in the description to get 83% off the per month rate. That's $56 total for two years, plus four months free, or just over $2 a month. Now back to the video. Next up, we need to decide what device we're gonna use on the end. And this device needs to have an SFP or SFB plus cage. Now these cages are electrically identical. The plus just denotes the maximum speed the cage can handle. 10 gig for SFP plus, one gig for SFP, at least with ethernet. Now these slots are intercompatible. You can put an SFP transceiver in an SFP plus slot. However, they don't auto negotiate speed. So you need to be able to configure your device if you wanna change the speed. If you have a device that has no web UI, it's purely an electrical converter, it'll be limited to whatever speed it says on the device. So if you have a 10 gig converter, it has to run at 10 gigs. If you have a switch or something you can log into the web UI for or a computer with a network card you can configure, you can reduce the speed from 10 gig to one gig and use 10 gig equipment with one gig transceivers and one gig on the other end. So here are some examples of media converters that I use personally in my home. There's a lot of other options. Check the description for some things I recommend. Nothing is sponsored down there except PIA that sponsored this video. This is a TP-Link MC220L. It's got an SFP slot for a single gigabit. Pop the transceiver in, super easy. Single gigabit copper, you can plug this into whatever you want. This is purely passive. There's no way to configure this. There's no way to force a certain speed. It's very cheap, currently selling for about 20 bucks. Great choice if you want to run fiber for long distance, not necessarily for 10 gig speeds. This is a Microtik Hex S, which is an ethernet router. So it's a router without Wi-Fi. It has an SFP port, which you can use for your WAN, or you can use it as another switch port. Again, this is one gigabit SFP. Transceiver goes in, super easy. I use this all the time for testing stuff. It's great because you can ping it, you can talk to it, you can configure it. If you just need a switch with one SFP port and some switch ports, they have a cheaper version of this called the RB260 that's usually on sale for less than 40 bucks, which is a great deal for an ethernet switch with SFP uplink. And if you're going to a computer, you can use an ethernet card in the computer. This particular model is a 25 gig card, but they look similar. So same as the other ones, transceiver pops in. This particular one's a dual port. There are other single port options. The example I used in my test is an Intel X520DA. The DA model signifies that it has these slots instead of RJ45, which is what we need for SFP transceivers. That's a 10 gig card, but it's frequently available on eBay for about 30 to 40 bucks. And of course, I also have my big switch in the other room, which is what I used for this test, 10 gig. If you're a fan of like Ubiquiti or Microtik, most of their switches are available with SFP or SFP Plus, depending on what model they are. And that works perfectly fine for this as well. Now that we know what speed we want to operate, which is determined by our endpoints, the SFP or SFP Plus slots, we have the fiber type we want. Now we need to pick transceivers that match. They pretty much all look like this. They're real tiny. They fit into the slot in the equipment, snap in, pretty easy. Plug your fiber in, good to go. But these come in all sorts of different models, for whatever configurations you need. If you've been following along and you're using duplex fiber, you'll need either a 10G base SR transceiver for multi-mode fiber, or an LR or LRM transceiver for single mode fiber. The M is just a shorter range two kilometer version. The uh, LR is the standard 10 kilometer version, but you're probably not going 10 kilometers, are you? You need the same transceiver on both ends. So an SR transceiver or an LR transceiver, it's matched to the fiber 
and it's also matched to the speed you're going at. You can take a 10 gig transceiver and run it at one gig, that does work. If you're doing bi-dye fiber, you need a matched pair. So one will transmit on one, fre on one frequency and receive on the other, and they will receive on the frequency A and transmit to frequency B. Um, I have links to those in the description if you want to use those. These are the parts that I used in my own house. I'm not sponsored or anything. If you're buying a lot of used enterprise hardware for this, especially like Cisco or the big names, you're going to have to be concerned with vendor lock-in. Most of these companies will reject transceivers if they're not uh, coded as their own brand. It's very easy to get around, and most sites will sell you a transceiver coded for any vendor. You just have to tell them ahead of time what vendor you want it coded for. But beware of that. If you're using something like Ubiquity or Microtik, neither of them care about vendor lock-in. They're not going to care if you put in a Cisco transceiver or a Cisco coded transceiver. Um, so if you have equipment in your lab, your home that needs a certain code, you can just get all that code. So in my case, I buy all Intel. Intel network cards are a little bit frustrating in that they're Intel coded. Um, you can disable it on the Linux side through a kernel module, but it's just easier to buy all Intel coded stuff for me. So for my setup, because I'm going relatively short distances, relatively in networking terms, I chose the two kilometer LRM transceivers, which were $3 cheaper than the LRs, and they worked perfectly fine. So if you click on this video because you want to go really fast, but don't actually care about the distance part of fiber, you might like a direct attached copper cable or a DAC cable. This cable here suspiciously looks like it has transceivers built in, and it kind of does. But there's no transceiver involved at all. There's just a coaxial cable or a twin ax cable between each of these transceiver ends. So I can take this and plug it in just as I would a transceiver, and I get a direct cable to connect to the other end, whether that's a network switch or a computer or whatever. And you can get these up to a few meters. If you're running within a network rack or the same room, this can be an excellent option for you. They don't cost very much, they're like 20 bucks. And you get all the advantages of high-speed fiber without the actual fiber itself. Downside, of course, is you have these massive connectors, so you're not going to go that far with them. And they are limited to about 5 meters or so before you do actually have to use real fiber. So hopefully, this video helped you with your first fiber networking setup at home. Or at least gave you the confidence that fiber isn't as expensive or difficult as it seems. By buying pre-made cables and sticking to reasonable speeds like gigabit or 10 gig, we can keep costs down and make this affordable and easy to use for home labbers or DIYers. If you're building your own setup, I have a guide down below on my blog post with a whole bunch of product recommendations, things that I've used in the past or things that are similar. None of that is sponsored, but you're free to check it out if it has a good example set up for you. Also be sure to check out the sponsor of this video, Private Internet Access, link down below again. If you want to follow more of my stuff, you can subscribe, I always like that. You can check out my Discord channel, link down below as well, and I'll see you on the next adventure.